This MUFON Canada podcast is brought to you by the award-winning documentary filmmaker Patty Crosley in an interview with Rob Freeman, UFO World Explorer. Rob, what was it that first inspired you to be interested in sky watching, in what might be up there? It actually started back in 1966 when I was coming out of Scouts in Sarnia, Ontario, uh, at the church. It was like 9.30 at night. I'd gone out the back door. My mom was picking me up, and I had to wait. And there was nobody around except these kids in the street. And when I came out the back door of the church, which kind of overlooks the river there, St. Clair River, at the bottom of Lake Huron, Sarnia, Ontario, Canada. And these kids said, hey, mister, there's a helicopter up in the sky. And I guess I looked like a mister at the age of 12 with my scout hat and tie and shiny black shoes and belt and shorts and, you know, calf socks and all that. But I looked up and I said to them, that's not a helicopter. Because I didn't see anything spinning. I didn't hear any sound. Um, the way it was operating was very strange. And I told the kids, that's not a helicopter. And they said, what is it? I said, I don't know. They kind of disappeared. And I kept watching this, waiting for my, my mom to arrive. And it was coming from the north, parallel to the river, up at about 800 feet. And it was this bright light. About the same brightness as when the ISS goes over and is very bright. Except that it was going from the north slowly to the south. But what gave away the strange phenomenon of what this was, was when it changed directions, it was in an instant. Like, in the blink of an eye, now it's going in the other direction. Mm -hmm. And I thought, that's weird. And my heart started pounding and I was kind of getting goosebumps because I thought, anything that's in the sky has to either come to a stop and go back the other way, or at least in an arc, it, to be able to change directions. Right. It can't change directions in an instant. Mm -hmm. And so each time it changed direction, it was going lower, and it come, going back and forth very slow. And when it was up at about maybe 600 feet, I could see that it, it was, I could see the, the shape of it was round, and it was like it had this light in the bottom. And when I looked, I squinted my eyes and looked, it was almost like that there was this lens in the bottom and the light was coming from inside the craft. And I could see figures moving. And at that point, my heart was pounding, <laughs> the hair was up on my arms. And I was thinking, oh my God, is this a flying saucer? Are these like ETs? What is this? Am I gonna be abducted? Because it, I felt like I was being stalked. Just then my mom arrived. And I thought, thank God. And I said, Mom, get out of the car. You got to see this. There's a UFO, flying saucer in the sky. And she just laughed and said, oh, Rob, don't be silly. She kind of thought it was my overactive imagination. <laughs> and I said, no, you got to get out of the car and see it. Finally, she got out of the car. She said, where is it? I pointed up and it was gone. And now I felt like an oh, idiot yeah. because, you know, she gets out of the car and there's nothing there. Did I imagine this? What was this? So it was pretty quiet in the car on the way home. I get home, I tell my dad, my brother, they just laugh. I went to my room, closed the door in disgust, and I was, you know, not happy. I did my homework and went to bed. The next day I went to school, and when I got home, my mom was all excited. She had the newspaper open. She says, Rob, what you saw last night's all over the front page of the newspaper. And at that second, I thought, yes, there is a God. <laughs> I was so happy oh, that I was yeah. validated what I saw. She read me the whole article. It went into the paper for two or three pages. They had done interviews with the police. They had done an interview with high ranking people at Selfridge Air Force Base on the US side that's just down the river from Port here and right across from Sarnia. Mm -hmm. They talked about how they had chased this object. They had sent off two jet fighters to chase this object, but it just took off, left them in the dust. And so they got into interviews and all of that. And you know, years later, um, I went back with my son Mark to the library in Sarnia. This is just a few years ago. 
and um, to get this article. And the crazy thing was, talk about conspiracy theories, is it only had the front page. Pages, I believe it was page two was missing. So the second page in was missing. And that's where they got into all the juicy details from what the base commander had talked right. about. So the lady at the library says, well, that can happen. They can sometimes miss pages when they do the microfilming and all that. We're going to check some of the other libraries around Canada. So there's like four or five other uh, repositories, and she called them all, and every single one had page two missing. So all the real juicy details from official people, like at the base, where they just spilt the beans about this, is all missing. But that's a whole another subject. So that's really got me, what's got me interested in this. Uh, I always wondered, was that something that we had and they were testing technology? But it was during the 1966 flap also of Lower Michigan, where they had the girls in that school near Dexter, Michigan, had seen a landing. And this is where they had you know, the famous people come, Jay at, uh, Heineck. Uh, came and uh, did his thing, and they pronounced it was probably swamp gas. He didn't know what to say, and he said swamp gas, so they rushed out and put that all over the newspaper. But what I saw was not swamp gas, yes. I can tell you that much. So that's how I got started. Did Heineck uh, eventually uh, retract things and, and I believe that he and, did. He got quite involved I, in this. That's a yeah, whole other story, yeah. right? Because he yeah. got quite interested in this. Yeah. But, you know, I didn't return again to this officially until my good friend Mark McNabb. Uh, we were doing movies together, children's movies. and We did movies right here in the house, for example. Mm -hmm. And we were up in the, you know, the loft department up at the top. And it was in between sets. And, you know, people are standing around waiting for the actors. They practice their lines. The ladies are getting their hair done, their makeup. And there's a lot of time that can happen before you start the next set while everybody gets ready. And in that time period, all the other supporting people of the film don't have much to do. As you may know, you're a producer. And so, you know, what do you do? Well, you storytell it. Yeah. You know, and what do you talk about? Well, it's friends, family, colleagues, work, interesting things, whatever comes up. It came up, has anybody ever seen a UFO? <laughs> I put my hand up and I says, I have, in fact, twice. Because two weeks after that incident, my friend had said, Rob, I'd like to see a, a UFO. How could we do it? And I said, maybe if we go on the roof of my house on a clear night, we could see them. And this is in Sarnia, it's a one floor home, shallow rooftop, uh, it's a pad home with no basement. We had the kind of antenna that's like a tower, it's got all the X's and you can just climb up. And so we took all of our stuff up there, you know, sleeping bag, pillow, you know, <laughs> binoculars, walkie talkies, camera, tape recorder, note and pad, uh, notepad and pencil, all this stuff. That's the original sky watching kit. You can see how it's evolved to yes. today. But we went up there and we were watching the skies. And after about 25 or 30 minutes, it was, we were getting a little bit cold. We'd run out of stuff to talk about. We hadn't seen anything. And I said to my friend, I don't think we're going to see. And I was about to finish the word anything when all of a sudden hundreds of lights came across the sky from the north from the north horizon all the way across to the south in like a second and a half. And we're looking, did you see that? Wow, that was pretty cool. What was it? I don't know. And then while we're talking, about 30 seconds later, hundreds of these lights again came from the south, returning all the way back to the north. So when I was telling my stories here at the house, Mark was listening, Mark McNabb, and that's the story that he was interested in because he thought, hmm, maybe it was coincidental that Rob saw that thing in Sarnia that was written up in the newspaper and over 200 people saw it. But a couple weeks later, him and his friend went up on the roof with the intention to see more, and they did. So that got him started. He didn't say a word. 
I told my stories, we went on to the next person, more stories were told about other things, and we continued filming the movie we were filming. So uh, that was interesting. He went away and he did research and he contacted different CE5 groups, different people around the world. And CE5? That's, that's a whole scale that Heineck developed about close encounters and so on, right? And uh, CE5 is so like that's communication. close encounters, yeah. CE. Okay. And of 5 is just time. one of the specific yes. things that people, you know, it's when you have communication, I believe. Yes. And so Mark went away and all the groups said, everybody said, Rob and his friend called them in. And uh, so he, you know, a few months later, he approached me. We went out for lunch and he says, I've got a proposal. He said, we're going to go traveling around the world. And I said, what for? He says, we're going to make contact with, we're going to see things. We're going to make contact with otherworldly beings. And I said, well, who's going to pay for this? He said, you are. <laughs> That's the way it works in filmmaking. So we have been traveling around the world for, well, what is it, seven or eight or nine years now? I don't even know. I think it's like seven years, I guess. We've been traveling around the world and we've been to 20 countries, like 200 cities. We've interviewed hundreds and hundreds of people. We've been out in the field. We've captured things. We actually met face to face with a being in the desert, not far from Uluru, you know, Ayers Rock in Australia. Oh, yes. We were face to face with a, well, who we believe was an ET being who looks like us. So some of the new ideas are that there is some kind of a psychic connection. And what are your thoughts on all of that? I would say there is. I mean, when you get into this phenomena, it's pretty far reaching. And, you know, lights in the sky is only one part of it. Like, when you get involved with this, you get a lot of other what we call cool, cool high strangeness happening. Oh, like what? Oh my gosh, where do I start? We've had things like uh, iPhone screens that were cracked. You know, weeks later, there's no crack, it's disappeared. We've had things like uh, what they call uh, a ports where I lost a camera screw on the beach at Playa Yaya and a few years later it turns up sitting on a box in my uh, pool table room, just sitting there. We've had things like where one of our members wrote a check for her rent was because we were gone in Australia and it had to be paid and it was then taken out of her book, which was supposed to be taken down to the landlord and the landlord cashed it and deposited it and she sees the scanned check in her bank app, but yet when we return, the check is still in the book. We've had things like when we were transferring flights through uh, 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 in the States, in California, in San Francisco, uh, because the flight was late leaving, we got lunch vouchers that one of our members spent and then when she checked her purse again for her boarding pass, there were the vouchers. And of course, when the lady cashier had taken them to redeem them, she had put a yellow marker on the name and the amount. And yet when our member checked for her boarding pass, she saw those two cards still there, but with no yellow highlight on them. She wanted to respend them, and I said, don't you dare, that's fraud. <laughs> we got on the plane and went to Mount Shasta. So it goes on and on and on and on and on of the number of cool, high strangeness things that can happen that seem to be all interconnected with this phenomenon. And from what I understand, from what I've seen, is a lot of batteries dying. Yes. Batteries that were totally charged. Yes, we've had that happen many times. We were at an, um, a conference in Lachlan, Nevada, one of Paula Harris's conference, conferences. And there was a film crew in from Los Angeles. And they were filming us. And right at the point when they asked, what are the kinds of things that can happen on your expeditions? I said, well... We'll have all our batteries die. 
right at that moment, the crew says, um, our batteries are dead. And they were fully charged. And all their, their batteries started dying. And that happened right on camera. So Marcus is filming the behind the scenes. We've got their crew filming the interview with this host guy. And it happens right at the UFO conference, right during the interview, all his batteries go dead. Now, you have, so, and everyone has so many questions about, are they from here originally? Are they still here? Are they with us? Uh, why are, are they observing us? I mean, there's a million questions. Yeah. What are some of the questions are there any questions that you've had answered well, with all of your... I guess one of the interesting things for me was when we had this encounter in Australia was many people say that ETs who are here on Earth are very Nordic looking. You know, tall, handsome, or as gals, very beautiful. Um, you know, blue-eyed, blonde hair, much like Nordic people. And the fellow that I... that came to our, right to our site at like 1.30 a.m. in the morning where we were observing with the equipment. Out of nowhere, he just pulled in off the road in the desert where we were. We were hidden in the bushes away from the road. How could he even know that we were there? But he came right to our spot. And there's also a bit of a phenomenon that happens when you're in a situation like this, like I would never in my normal mind let him get away without spending time letting observing with us, yes. be observing with us, but somehow, I don't know, I've heard this story many times, they dumb you down. And oh. I somehow let him get away. But what I can tell you is he was Nordic looking. We did talk to him. There was nothing that made sense about his story. It seemed to be all canned. He had his inflections were almost non-existent with emotions. It was almost like he was, it was all rehearsed, that he was practicing in advance of what to say and how to act. It was all artificial. It didn't seem like a real human being to talk. Uh, but yes, we did have an encounter. Yes, it was real. There was two of us, a um, lady from Australia, Lauren. And, but your, the question that you asked me is, we had met uh, Paul Hellyer, interviewed him many times. He was our uh, defense minister who knows all these secrets and after he left public service he got quite in, involved and interested in UFOs because of different things that happened during his time as defense minister and he told us that you know the species of ETs in the Milky Way galaxy the beings all look very similar to us he says you would never know the difference if you ran into one on the street. It could be your cousin, your uncle, a friend. They all look similar to us. It's only when you get into other galaxies that they start to look different and you see these familiar almond-shaped eyes and you know even different other kinds of looking beings. And that made sense to me. That was interesting. Um, so this fellow that we met, this ET, must have been from our Milky Way galaxy. I guess the big question is, what proof is there? What would Paul did Paul Hellyer ever write anything about his? Ah, uh, he wrote some books around this subject. Did he? Okay. Um, what proof is there? That's what people. It's always hard need. to get because, yeah. you know, this whole disclosure thing. If you ask me, this is only my opinion, and my feelings. But it's a slow drip. You know, now whether it's the government causing that or the ETs themselves that are causing that, or a combination of the two, I don't know. But I can tell you with this equipment here, with this thermal camera, we were out on the patio at a conference uh, in Australia, and uh, Damien Knott, who's the, the sort of the biggest sky watcher in Australia, and the most famous, mm -hmm. I had the equipment set up and I said, do you wanna look through a thermal? He had never seen a thermal. I said, I made a joke. Maybe you'll see a UFO. <laughs> he looks through, and of course, there is a classic saucer with a dome going across the skyline above, I forget which city it was, whether it was Sydney or Brisbane. 
And he says, I th- in his accent, I think a gold one. And <laughs> I said, may I see? And I, I looked in the camera and there it was. A classic saucer with the dome in the thermal camera going across. We had the recorder going. None of the other cameras captured it in the infrared, in the visible. None of the other cameras were able to capture it. Even other people with their cameras that were there, nobody could see it. You could only see it in this thermal camera. And I thought, fantastic, I will get the proof. However, when I took this the SD card out, went upstairs to my room, the hotel where the conference was, put the SD card in the computer and played it. It's like, where's the picture? It was all snow, but the sound was all there in our excitement. Even Mark, when he filmed us in the background, he got the whole event happening, but it wasn't recorded. Like, and I, I got very upset just for a moment, but then I thought, wait a minute, it wouldn't let you, rec- they wouldn't let you record the video. You got the audio, yeah. but they wouldn't let you get the video because they don't want you to have it. And that is likely the case with so much of this. And they'll only let you get what they want you to get. I do have a picture. I have my phone right here. Mm-hmm. I have a picture of something we caught in uh, not far from Cusco, Peru. Can we add that to this documentary? Thing? Yes, by all means. We'll, uh, we'll make sure that... There it is right there. Yeah. And that's an authentic picture of something in the sky, in the mountains, away from all city lights, yeah. away from all civilization. And even Luis Elizondo himself, who's now written books, who is the head of the Pentagon UFO group in the States. He's in private, uh, you know, since you're a private citizen now. He told me that that was the energy imprint of a craft leaving our dimension. So now that's a whole other subject. It totally and, is. and now there are so many things about dimensions and uh, do they come and go from <laughs> Yeah, and you know, it's likely how they get here. They're using, you know, portals, wormholes, who knows? Yeah. They likely are not using conventional means to come light years across the universe. Yeah, yeah. If they are even coming across the universe. They could be right here, they've always been here, just in another dimension. They seem to travel mm-hmm. in and out of these dimensions. So now you're in contact with a number of. Are they known as sky watchers? Is that what you call yourself? Yeah, you could say sky watcher. Uh, we're just. But you exploring. have contact with a lot of mm-hmm. explorers, mm-hmm. and uh, so really you're helping uh, distribute information. We are. And that's we, w- what was lacking for so many years. Yeah, we. You know, we go into an area like one of the countries, one of the cities. We'll, we'll in advance, Marcus will, you know, meet different people of the subject in the area. Uh, a lot of times, they're introduced to us by others. So there's a chain, you know, that gets us to these people, um, and then once we get there, we'll meet them. We'll do interviews. We'll go out in the field with them, sky watching. And, uh, and hopefully we have, you know, things happen, uh, things that we can document, and usually we're never disappointed. Yeah. What would you say your, do you have a goal in all of this? Is there something that, what well, is it? Well, yes, uh, we do want to get what we experience and what we find out, out to the public and to the young people, so we are doing documentaries. And you've re- Written books, yes, yes, we've got a book out already. Making contact, and or the man who wanted to make contact, it's on Amazon. But there's two more coming that are almost fully written. Uh, we want to get this information out, and now in some cases we may have deeper encounters which they will not let us film. But Marks and I have agreed that we like to experience, and if we can document, that's great. If they won't let us document it, we at least can have the experience together. We can go in front of a green screen and we can be interviewed. We can interview each other and tell our story, even if we can't back it up 
with hard film evidence because it's it's very unlikely that they will let you get video or photos of the beings themselves. There are some, you see there are a lot of people that are scientifically oriented that are very practical people involved in sky watching and, and investigating. Mm -hmm. uh, I know you, you work with, with Mark uh, McNabb and Dave Palachek who is scientifically, he's, he does a lot of the research and the mm -hmm. actual um, uh, debunking. Debunking, <laughs> right, debunking. Yes, Thank yeah, you, yeah. debunking. So that is a big part of what you are looking to do, is to debunk things. Well, we do debunk find, everything that we yeah. capture, because you may first think, at first blush, this is authentic, but when you really do your research, it may turn out to be something else. So, you know, really, out of everything that's posted on the internet, you know, maybe, you know, less than 2 or 3% is actually authentic. That's right. Because it could be just a satellite, but if you capture a satellite moving and it comes to a stop, that's not a satellite. So, there's clues in what you film, whether it's authentic or not. We've had strange things happen, for example, Munns Park, Arizona, you know, not that far from Sedona up in the mountains. The entire cell service on both networks went down just as we saw something in the sky. So, is that coincidence? Mm, probably not. Have you got anything else that you'd like to let people know about what you've discovered? I, you know, I would, yeah, I would advise them to just relax, go outside in your backyard, Enjoy your evening, have fun, and just look up. And that will get you started. And if you go with the intention that you would, and you have an open mind, sooner or later you will see something or you will have a very interesting experience. And remember, looking up in the sky and seeing the lights, that's where it gets started. But that's not where it ends. It just keeps expanding and expanding and expanding. <laughs> Rob Freeman, thank you so much, and you and Dave Palachek and Chad, uh, you just, uh, Mark, you keep going and let us know what you find. Well, thank you very much for having me, Patty. Much appreciated. <laughs>